20th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness, to do God's work in the world. Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you 
though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that you may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light, and I create darkness. I wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Word of hope, word of life. Rejoice, rejoice, 
The second lesson is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for you and mention you in our prayers constantly remembering before our God the Father of your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia in Achaia, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those re regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Word of hope, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to the 22nd chapter of Matthew. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test hypocrites. Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart over this past week, that you may be glorified, that they be pleasing to you, and most importantly, faithful to your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this past week, we had our bishop's convocation, virtually, of course, and during the service, Bishop Shelley preached on verse 4 in particular of our text from 1 Thessalonians that we had today. It was a big part of our focus. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. And in fact, she even scoped it down a bit more to that phrase, he has chosen you. And this resonated with me from the start. And it's fitting because it's such a part of our Lutheran understanding and theology that in our baptism, God has chosen us has called us by name and claimed us as God's own. On top of that, as I read through the scriptures, I'm reminded again and again that this phrase, being chosen, or the idea of being chosen by God, is found in the scriptures from the beginning all the way up to this point where we hear from Paul. You go back to Genesis chapter 11 and 12 toward the beginning of the scriptures, and Abram, who's later called Abraham, is chosen by God, is called by God 
to create and form together a new people that will be in relationship with God. This Abram, who is worshiping and living in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, worshiping other gods, and God chooses Abram and gives Abram promises. He says, come and follow me, and I will give you the land that you need. Come and follow me, and I will give you descendants. You will be a great nation, meaning you will have many kids, many descendants, which we find out later on will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand along the sea. And you will be a blessing, blessing to other nations. And this incredible gift in this choosing of Abraham, that he, he and these people will be a blessing to other nations. That they will be there to be a light of God's love, to show the nations around them what God's love looks like. That they will be a blessing to those in their community. That the foreigners who come into their land, that they will be welcomed and received in with great hospitality. That the poor and those that are struggling will be remembered and that a tenth, the outer tenth of the land of people's crops will be left for the poor to be able to be fed with, since they have such meager to no means to sustain themselves. Yes, they will be a blessing for the world. Now, Abram wasn't perfect at all of this. Of course, when it came time and it seemed like God's promise of kids was not going to happen and they were in their 90s and God said, no, it's going to happen, they laughed. But Abram was chosen by God and essential in God's eyes in spite of this. Essential to the building and growth of this relationship between God and God's people. Essential to the reality of a leader who would help carry these people and help keep them faithful and tuned in to God. The times that the people got away from being who they were, this blessing to the world, was when they turned their focus away from God, and they started to look at the nations and things around them. And I want to be like that. We want to be like that. Look at those nations. They have kings. We want kings because, look, they have these powerful armies that they set up to protect them or to go and get land and things from others. We want that. God's looking at them and saying, well, what do you want that for? I, have I not been taking care of you? Have I not been guiding you? You know what's going to happen if you get these kings? You get these kings, they're going to send their kids to war. They're going to lock down their women. They're going to require taxes and take part of your land and your crops from you. And indeed, that's what happened. But God, in his grace, in his mercy, in his, okay, I'll let you have it, see what happens, allows this reality to come forth. And of course, the history shows that these people who are chosen by God, who are essential in God's eyes to being a blessing for the world around, end up getting caught up with these other nations and lose sight of who they are. Forget, if you will, that they are chosen by God and essential in the process of God's work in the world. And so we have good kings and we have bad kings. The good kings focus on God and paying attention and remembering who they are. And then the bad kings that lose sight and start to put their trust in foreign leaders and foreign institutions of the time. David, he's another one that's chosen by God, a great leader to replace Saul, but again, not perfect. But while he's chosen by Saul, he is also seen as essential in God's eyes, essential to the leading of the people that God has formed together and called God's own. And then we get to Isaiah. My favorite verse I've shared before comes from Isaiah 43. I have called you by name, you are mine. And when you go through the waters, they won't overwhelm you. When they go through the fires, you will not be burned. And he talks about these different nations that are given exchange for the people. Why? Because they are precious in God's eyes and God loves them. Precious and loves them. They are chosen by God. They are essential in God's eyes to the growth of our world, knowing and understanding the depth and love of God for all creation. You know, the other day made me think, well, what does this look like in life in ways that maybe we don't even think about? And many of you know I'm a big race fan from sprint cars to IndyCar to NASCAR. And I was looking for a podcast, a specific podcast, and saw one from former driver Danica Patrick. And I was going to skip over it, but she was interviewing Dale Earnhardt Jr. And while I've learned a lot about Jr. from his own podcast, I learned some new things as I sat and listened to this one. He had talked about how he was so awkward, and this is how he described himself. He was very awkward. He was quiet. He wasn't popular. He didn't have a whole bunch of friends. He 
called himself an introvert. And as I heard him talk about that, it was almost as if he had a negative, negative connotation to, to what that meant. And he said, as he was describing it, it wasn't until he went to this Christian school that he started to come out of his shell. And he started to come out of his shell in a way that he, he never had a sense was possible. He started to have confidence in himself, see the value of who he was. And what bonded him together and allowed this to happen in that setting was he was with others who felt much the same way he did. You see, apparently the school was a lot of kids that were sent that were having some struggles and the idea was to help them in that process. You see, it was their, what the world might call as awkwardness, not fitting in totally or not matching what things quote should be in the world. It was that that brought them together. It was there that not his language, but mine, but I think he began to see that he was chosen by God, that he was essential in God's eyes, that he was valuable and had these gifts to share. And we began to see in his lifetime what those gifts are, not just as a great jiver, but as the person he is and the things he stands up for and the way he treats the people around him. So it's this wonderful gift and place of realization that we all are essential in God's eyes chosen by God to be a blessing in this world. Now that said, you've heard me use the word essential several times, and I know it's an important in, in phrase in our society right now, particularly for our frontline workers and the risks that they put themselves in for all of us and the struggles that go with that. Well, I was driving to church the other day and I came up behind a car and it had a sticker on the window and it said, Jesus is essential. And I was okay there, but then the second part came and I was disappointed and my shoulders just dropped. It said, Jesus is essential, but Jay Inslee, not so much. Seriously? You're taking your politics, sticking them on a window, and claiming as if Jesus and tying it to there are the same thing. You could have put Jay Inslee's name on there, Lauren Culp's name, President Trump, Biden. It didn't matter. In that moment, what I saw was a demeaning of Jesus' name, a demeaning of Jesus' name to push what I would call as well gutter politics and the stuff that's going around where we sling mud back and forth at each other, not just in politics, but even in our own relationships, but politics, which is not a bad thing. It's part of what helps move our world and gives us um, some good solid guidance and, and direction and leadership. But this mudslinging that's happened. And there it was to me, right there on that window. It was trying to lift Jesus up, but in the process, slamming one of God's creation down. That not everybody even feels that way about that person. Jesus is essential, stop there, leave it. Because it doesn't match who Jesus is, who God has been for us. Take a look at Jesus' life. While he was alive in his ministry, who did he focus on? He focused on the people that those who were up here in positions of power and status put down and forgot and left out and would have had the bumper sticker that sought to cut somebody else down. He cared for the poor, for the outcasts, for the ones that had demons and were possessed that weren't to be touched. He touched and healed them that had been cast off to the enemies that weren't the friends of the people. He acknowledged them and showed them their value. They too were chosen by God and essential in God's eyes because they are God's beloved created in God's image. And then you take it a step farther. You take it a step to the place of Jesus' last days. He comes into town as we celebrate on Palm Sunday and I've mentioned so many times in humility on a donkey. The people praise, Hosanna, come save us. And he had come to save them. But then they started to see the whole of the picture and he's on his way to the cross. What are you doing? What are you on this symbol of humility? What are you going towards the cross for? That's weakness, that's death. That's the loss of our hope. You're supposed to come more like the Roman Empire. That's how it works in our world. You come with strength and might and armies behind you and power. That's what it's all about. Get a position of power and lord it over others. And Jesus' life is, I have come for you and I have come to lift you up, but I've also come for the whole of creation because every single person from the Roman soldiers that drove the spikes to the religious leaders that, that put the nails in Jesus' hand 
uh, on, on the cross or put him, the religious leaders that move the crowds to put him up to be crucified, they are all, as we are, God's children in this world. That's where that sticker doesn't match who Jesus is. And we demean Jesus' name and we demean and lessen who God is and what God is about in a sticker like that for our own purposes and our own political opinions on how things should be. Do you see the deeper thought that you need to put behind something like that? When we as a church make these public proclamations like that and tie Jesus' name to it, often I think unfairly, unwittingly, unthoughtfully, but more so just about our own maybe self-righteousness, how we think everything should be, that we proclaim that and put that out there publicly, the world is watching. We're called to something different than that. Way back in the beginning, God has said, I've chosen you. You are essential in my eyes to being a blessing in this world, helping people see what love looks like, helping people see what mercy and compassion looks like. There were people called to lift up, not to shame someone publicly, not to push them down in the mud and treat them as if they have no value. You know, whatever name you put on there, you put on there, Jay Inslee's name, which was on the sticker. They are chosen by God and essential in God's eyes in this world. President Donald Trump's name could be put on there. He is chosen by God and essential in God's eyes for this world. You put Joe Biden's name on there. He is chosen by God and essential in, in God's eyes in this world. Lauren Culp, who wants to unseat uh, Jay Inslee, he is chosen by God and essential in this world. We're all beloved and chosen by God and essential in this world. And we need to have our eyes open and look and see the incredible mercy of God that God is giving us that we might reflect that in this world because they are essential. I am essential. The person who put that sticker on the back of their car is chosen by God and essential in God's eyes for this world and the blessing God sent them out to be. And you are essential. You are chosen by God and essential in God's eyes to be that blessing that God has made you and sent you out into the world to be. May we be a people that when we bring up Jesus' name, it's because we're pointing to Christ, not ourselves, not our agenda, not our political swaying, because all of those pieces come in imperfect. And all those pieces in most occasions have somebody who's lifted up and another who's pushed down. And the cross, to, to mean Jesus' name like that in such a way, it lessens what God has done and given up for the world. The cross is about bringing out of death, resurrection, and life. Let's be a people, particularly publicly, because the world is watching, that seek to bring life and acknowledge that I'm created in the image of God and you're created in the image of God and the person we have never met is created in the image of God, loved by God, chosen by God, essential in God's eyes, each of us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, may we have the courage, and the compassion, the mercy, and the love to use the gifts God has given us, not to tear down, but to build up and to be a blessing in our world. Amen.
confess our faith together with our brothers and sisters across our world in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and, and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among preachers, missionaries, and evangelists. We give thanks for the witness of your servant Luke, the evangelist, whom the church commemorates today. Lord, in your mercy. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation from the rising of the sun to its setting. May the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. God in all, may our word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. Lord, in your mercy. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, and doubt. Gracious host, let your gentleness be, not, gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill. We especially remember Inez Hushagen, Annette Hollingsworth, Linda Johnson, Wayne Moat, Teresa Luce, Greg Luce, Brittany Scott, Logan Dennis, Nikki Belk, Richard Ward, Leif Larson, Pam Larson, Carla Rickerson, Pastor Don O'Claire, Scott Smith, TC, Allison Vogue, Martha Hafer, Colleen Cross, Sharon Wagonist, and John Munson. Continue to be with your communities ravaged with wildflowers, fires, floods, and other natural disasters. Be with those communities where violence is happening and has happened. We continue to remember all those suffering from the coronavirus, their families, and communities they live in. We also remember those whose name, who we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of justices, magistrates, court officials, and all vocations of law, that your promise of restoration may be known. Lord, in your mercy. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold your loving arms all for whom we pray. We offer all these prayers to you through the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Greetings uh, for announcement time today. Uh, first thing I want to put out there in regards to announcements is in regards to worship. Uh, we continue with our drive-in services and just figure until you hear something different on that, we will continue forward until the weather gets a little too rough for us out there perhaps. As I've shared with others, I could stand out there in 25 degrees and snow, it wouldn't bother me at all. Uh, but for those of you sitting in the car, it's a little bit different story. So as I say that, always know that the online services are going to continue on, on into the idea is just to keep those going for however long, even when we end up back in the building full time and are back to whatever the new normal normal is in the, in the long haul. But also wanted to, to let you know that either you've received a call or will be receiving a call in the next couple of days. Uh, from our care team, some, some care team members, they're, they're working on that and other members of the congregation. We're just looking with the weather changing as we get into December of some different options and ways in which we might be able to come together and what your comfort level is. And um, share, we're going to share that with the, the council as they continue uh, to, to monitor the cases and what's happening around COVID. Um, as always, it's about it's about caring for our neighbor and caring for the most vulnerable among us. So difficult decisions to, to make along the way, and thank you for your continued prayers with that. So if you don't get a call by, say, Wednesday, um, give the office a call. Just realize we had a couple of folks missing in our directory that I'm not sure how it got moved, but we need to, to check on that. So if you're watching this and you haven't gotten a call, um, go ahead and give the office a call or email at CamenoCLC at WaveCable.com. Um, Wednesday night, we continue. This will be number four of the Dialogues on Race. Had a good discussion last week, so thank you to Pastor Lauren and his continuing to do that. You still can join. Um, either leave a message at the church, either a phone, or again, send an email in. And uh, Stephanie will be back in the office this week. Thank you to Teresa, who stepped in for her uh, while she was on vacation this last, this last week. Um, but go ahead and call and we can get you on the email list to get the link out to you. As you saw in the service, it is Lutheran World Relief Sunday and we have the blessing of the quilts and the kits. And so if you would like to give to that, um, you can go ahead, either donate online or if you send a check, just put down in the memo line that it's for the benevolence of the month, uh, Lutheran World Relief. And it looks like those are going to be um, being shipped over to Beirut to help out where they had the ex explosion. So uh, the, the ladies have gotten together and put those pieces together, and we're really thankful and appreciative of all their work with that, as usual. Just an update on um, Inez. Wanted to let you know that Inez is out of the hospital, and she is settling in over at Brookdale. That will be her, her new home here. And they're transferring her phone number over, so it should have been transferred over by now. It's her old number, um, so you can give her a call. I know they aren't just letting visitors in, from what I understand, so uh, maybe just a phone call. But she's feeling, she's feeling better and uh, good enough to, to head home, but she's going to be living over at Brookdale now. So continue to pray for her, and Pam and Leif continue to keep them in our prayers. And then I think you heard in the, the announcements, Phil is going to be going in for exploratory surgery on his heart on Monday. So keep him in your prayers. Those are all of our announcements for now. 
I wish you blessings on your week. God's peace.